iPhones have been exposing MAC addresses for years. Google has rolled out some interesting updates for your privacy, allegedly. Samsung has been shutting down phones remotely. AirVPN is reporting that they had a server seized. Apple browser exploits, a lot going on the last couple weeks. Of course, you know how it is. We take a week off and everything happens. So welcome to Surveillance Report 154, where we are dedicated to keeping you private and secure with the latest news from the past two weeks. I am Nathan from The New Oil. And I'm Henry from TechLore. Our promo spot this week, as always, we have Patreon. If you want to keep us going and get some stuff in return, for $5 a month or more, you get to ask us questions for our weekly Q&A. For $10 a month or more, you don't have to hear this segment, and you get some more of our analysis and personal opinions. If you don't really care about that, but you just want a recurring, easy way to support us where you can kind of set it and forget it, we have LibrePay. And last but not least, as always, we have Monero, anonymous cryptocurrency. We don't know anything about you, but we do see all your contributions, and they really help us keep going. They pay for the bills, keep the lights on, and free up a little bit more of our time so we can focus on this. So thank you guys very much for everyone who is able to support us. We really appreciate you. And then Henry wanted to respond to some some of the comments real quick before we jump in. Well, I don't know if there were many comments about it because I didn't check, but just a heads up. So a couple of weeks ago, there were some uh, surveillance stories regarding the stuff going on uh, regarding wars and whatnot. And I was soloing that week and I didn't have the energy to cover it and deal with the people who wouldn't be able to have a healthy discussion around it. So I decided to cut those stories. They were it's still in the show notes for people to check the show notes. And actually some people covered the story in our forum and that they couldn't have a healthy discussion about it either. For people who want to look into that story, it's there for them. There are some good stories there. And I think for the record, Nate disagreed with that decision. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I did. uh, I did give it a listen last week. And I was like, man, I could have swore I put these stories in the notes. For the record, I totally understand where you're coming from. It is really exhausting. And I I know we were talking about this before we recorded. We we did kind of take a stance on Russia and Ukraine. But in our opinion, that's a lot less controversial. Not that we're afraid to be controversial, but it's just Israel and Palestine is a really sticky situation. And we just I understand where he's coming from. It's hard to talk about that without it just descending into chaos. So I get it. Yeah. I wish we could have covered it, but the, the the stories were still in the show notes and they are important. Also something else, uh, it was supposed to be my week last week. So I also didn't do that last week. So yeah, we are now doing two weeks of updates. So speaking of, thanks for uh, hanging in there without me. And thanks for Henry. Thanks to Henry for holding down the fort. Okay. With all that out of the way, we're going to go ahead and jump into the highlight story, which is Pretty troubling. The headline says iPhones have been exposing your unique Mac address despite Apple's promises otherwise. Three years ago, I think they said it was an iOS 14. Apple introduced a privacy enhancing feature that hid the Wi-Fi address of iPhones and iPads when they joined a network. On Wednesday, the world learned that the feature has never worked as advertised. Despite promises that this never changing address would be hidden and replaced with a private one that was unique to each Wi-Fi network or SSID, Apple devices have continued to display the real one, which in turn got broadcast to every other connected device on the network. So this past week, Apple rolled out iOS 17.1, which included several fixes, but among them, it includes this fix. So uh, lesson number one, be sure to update because this fixed a thing that we didn't even know was an issue. One security researcher who was credited with discovering and reporting this vulnerability, he said, quote, from the get-go, this feature was useless because of this bug. We couldn't stop the device from sending these discovery requests, even with a VPN, even in the lockdown mode which is extra troubling for lockdown mode, which the article says. Some kind of very light details on how it worked for those curious. They said, quote, digging in a little further, it became clear that the real permanent MAC address was still broadcast to other connected devices, just in a different field of the request. So it was still visible, it just wasn't in the MAC address field. They said, in fairness to Apple, the feature wasn't useless because it did prevent passive sniffing, but the failure to remove the real MAC address still meant that anyone connected to a network could pull the unique identifiers with no trouble, which as we said, could be an issue if you're a targeted person. Apple has not explained how a failure is based because this one escaped notice for so long. There's a ton of data breaches. I don't think either of us have the patience to really go into these because otherwise it'll be like an hour just going through data breaches. So we're gonna go through these as quick as possible and we're gonna shorten things up. So definitely check the show notes if you really want to dive into any of these specifically. The first one is from D-Link, who's confirmed a data breach after an employee phishing attack, which impacted uh, names, emails, addresses, phone numbers, account registration dates, and users' last sign-in date. Uh, This also includes Taiwanese government officials, plus CEO and several employees. Next one comes from 23andMe, which has leaked millions of more records. 
Specifically, this included 4 million users. Unlike the last breach, these were mostly people from Great Britain, including data from, quote, the wealthiest people living in the US and Western Europe, unquote. There's still a lot of unanswered questions. It's not known if the attackers actually use credential stuffing and not another technique, how much data was stolen, and what the attackers intend to do with it. Next one, Casio has disclosed a data breach impacting customers in 149 countries, including names, email addresses, countries of residence, service usage details, and purchase information like payment methods, license codes, and other specifics. It seems like it predominantly hit uh, Japanese customers, as well as some other people from those other 148 countries outside of Japan. All right, this next one you guys probably heard about, Okta suffered a security incident where attackers stole their access tokens from the support unit. They said that this affected a quote unquote, very small number of customers. They're being very, very tight lipped. For those who want more details, it looks like this came from, there's something called an HTTP archive or an HAR file, HAR, I don't know how that's pronounced. Basically, it's kind of like a snapshot of your browser session and sometimes people will send those over for troubleshooting purposes. Sometimes those can include things like cookies and session tokens, which we've said before, intruders, if those get stolen, they can basically just drop it into their browser and now they're already logged in. They're already authenticated. They are you. So that's exactly what happened here. Attackers got a hold of these from the support group and were able to access some sessions. Okta said that this affected about 1% of customers, which would be about 170-ish customers. This also included 1Password, which we'll link to that article. The good news is 1Password said nothing was really, like they didn't access any information and they immediately detected the activity and closed it down. And then unfortunately, something I didn't put in the show notes here, but we only know about this because one of Okta's customers disclosed it. I think it was Beyond Trust. They noticed there was something fishy. They traced it back to Okta. They disclosed it and then Okta was forced to disclose it. It looks like this was pretty limited. So that's the good news there. Next breach is interesting. It comes from the city of Philadelphia who disclosed a data breach after five months. And they said they may have gained access to city email accounts containing personal and protected health information back in May, but they found they probably did because they exposed a combination of demographic info like name, address, date of birth, social security numbers, and other contact information, as well as medical information and other treatment related information. Not good for those in Philadelphia. Not good for University of Michigan either. They had their data stolen in a cyber attack. This included students, applicants, alumni, donors, employees, patients, and research study participants. The article did not disclose how many people were affected. This included social security number, driver's license or government ID number, financial account or payment card number, health info for research participants specifically. This could also include demographic information, financial information, clinic information, and information related to the study they participated in. So cyber criminals email stolen student data to parents of Nevada school districts. So this is a very big school district in the U.S. And these emails that they're sending off to parents include PDF files that contain student stolen data, including student photos, addresses, student ID numbers, and email addresses. And in a fun twist, the attackers are trying to pretend like they're the good guys via this statement. They did not detect a security issue. We emailed them to tell them we had been in their network for a few months. For six years, they forced students to use their birthday as their password, resetting the passwords back to their birthday each year. They even prevented the students from securing their accounts. We asked for less than one third of Jesus F. Jarrah's annual salary in exchange for destroying the stolen data. And the incompetence of the leadership is astounding. Not only do they not cooperate, it is clear they did not communicate with principals and have still not plugged their leaky ship, meaning we still have access to the network. So they're pretty much trying to be like, well, they're insecure. And so we're teaching them a lesson and we're the, the big guys here. This did include student emails, birth dates, ethnicities, PSAT scores, health information, suspensions, incident reports, and other info. They also leaked what state the financial reports, staff salaries, and grant information from the district as well. So ASVEL basketball team confirms data breach after ransomware attack. So this is a French professional basketball team, LDLC Asvel. They have confirmed that the data was stolen after the no escape ransomware gang claimed to have attacked the club. They claim that they have stolen 32 gigabytes of data, including the personal data of players, passports, and ID cards, and many documents relating to finance, tax and legal matters, NDAs, contracts, confidential letters, contractual agreements with players, etc. Asvel says that it has no evidence that the attackers have stolen its fans' payments data or bank account details. The incident has been reported to the, uh, what is it, CNIL? I forget how that's pronounced. Canil? Whatever. France's National Data Protection Authority and a formal complaint is soon to be submitted to law enforcement. It is worth noting that Asvel has been removed from No Escape's Darknet portal and a link to the entry now returns a 404 error and no data has been leaked. So this could indicate the club is negotiating to prevent the leak of data. Next one is from CCleaner, who already hasn't had a great reputation for a while, but this shouldn't help. So they say cyber criminals stole users' personal data during the Move It mass hack. Pretty much, uh, they, CCleaner is one of the organizations that used the Move It software, and they were impacted by this too. 
And the email to customer said that the hackers took names, contact information, and information about the products that were purchased. This is less than 2% of users that were affected, but they didn't specify what that number was. And our last couple stories are updates. The first one comes from Seiko, who is a Japanese watchmaker. We talked about them before. They have now confirmed that they did indeed suffer a ransomware attack from Black Cat, which exposed customer information, including names, addresses, telephone numbers, and or email addresses, contact information for counterparts involved in business transactions, including names, company affiliation, job title, company address, company phone number, and or company email address, information supplied by applicants for employment, like names, addresses, phone numbers, email addresses, and or educational background and personal information, including names and or email addresses for both current and former employees of Seiko Watch Corporation and its group companies. In the last data breach, DC Board of Elections, cyber criminals may have breached entire voter roll. So this is the voter roll that may have been exposed, containing a wide range of personally identifiable information, including driver's license numbers, date of births, partial security numbers, and contact information like phone numbers and email addresses. All right, with that, we'll move into companies. We'll start off with Google Chrome's new IP protection that will hide users' IP addresses. So this is exactly what it sounds like. This is gonna start with certain websites. They haven't really said exactly how, but they're gonna roll this out in phases. They're looking for websites that I guess are most known for kind of tracking users via IP addresses, and they're gonna start routing the traffic of Chrome users through proxies so these websites can't get your IP addresses. Initially, this will be an opt-in feature, in the initial approach, only the domains listed will be affected in third-party context, zoning in on those perceived to be tracking users. In the first phase, dubbed phase zero, Google will be proxying requests to its own domains using a proprietary proxy. This will help Google test the system's infrastructure and buy more time to fine tune the domain list. To start with, only users logged into Chrome with US-based IP addresses can access these proxies. In upcoming plans, they plan to adopt a two-hop proxy system to increase privacy further. Well, similarly, Google Play Protect is adding real-time scanning to fight Android malware. So in the past, Google scans Play Protect with Google Play Store apps. But now if you sideload something, like you install an APK or something like that, there's now a real-time scanning that's gonna be done as you're installing the application. This is done on the server end. So when you are scanning the app, if they don't already have the app, it's going to be sent to Google and then Google's gonna scan it and decide if it's safe or not. And then some objectively bad news from Google. I like this headline. When is a privacy button not a privacy button? When Google runs it, claims lawsuit. So for the past three years, Google has been fighting a lawsuit that claims the company has a misleading menu that promises privacy but fails to provide it. So this is the web and app activity setting, which is in your Google account. And it basically says, uh, if it's checked, it allows Google to include Chrome history and activity from sites, apps, and devices that use Google services, presumably for advertising. They say, according to Google, when it's enabled, it saves your activity on Google sites and apps, including associated info like location to personalized searches, recommendations, and other services. But according to this lawsuit, when it's turned off, Google still saves people's data. They're basically saying like, it's still collecting the data. It's just putting it on Google servers instead of in your account. This expert witness said, I'm aware that Google may save data in different locations depending on where the switch is set. It's still collecting the same data and saving it, but it may save it in different places. Next, Samsung and other manufacturers disable phones bought on gray markets. So essentially, especially Samsung, have taken a drastic step that have left a lot of customers outraged, which is the remotely disabling phones purchased via gray markets and holding users' data hostage until they buy new phones from official retailers. This apparently seems to be a common thing in Mexico, as well as other particular regions, and they not only do they send messages regarding non-compliance with Mexican regulations, but they also remotely disabled the phones, rendering them useless. The move was far from the expected outcome. If a device truly posed safety risks, it should have been switched off completely. Instead, Samsung allows the devices to turn on, but denied users access to their data and applications. This next one is good news. It says face search engine PimEyes blocks searches of children's faces. Due to concerns about children's privacy, PimEyes is banning searches of minors. If you guys haven't heard of them, I know we've mentioned them a couple times. This is a subscription-based service that uses facial recognition technology to find online photos of a person, and they have a database of nearly 3 billion faces with about 118,000 searches per day. So they're kind of like Clearview. I think based on this article, it sounds like the owner's a little bit less terrible of a person, but I'm just basing that on this article. I don't know much about the guy. They are open to the public. So you can use this to like he actually mentions that in the article, the owner says like the goal of this site is you can find where your pictures are and if you don't want them there, you can take them down or you know submit a request or whatever. That's what he says. Again, I'm just basing it off this article. Dude could be a liar for all I know. But anyways, the article goes on to say parents have used PimEyes to find photos of their children on the internet that they have not known about. But of course, that's a double-edged sword. It could also be used by a stranger. They don't 
actually verify any information about you. So as a result, they're just now using AI to ban all searches on photos of minors. The owner admits that it works well for children under 14, but there are accuracy issues once they start to get into the teenage years. It also may be unable to identify children if they're not photographed like directly uh, head on. The New York Times said they uploaded photos of Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen from back when they were small children, and it blocked the search for, they, they have a picture on the article. Um, one of the twins is looking right at the camera and the other one's like looking at her sister. And the one who was looking at the camera found her no problem. The one who was, uh, or, or blocked her, no issues. The one that was like from the side, they pulled up tons of pictures because it didn't realize it was a kid. Next story is from Telegram, who is still leaking user IP addresses to contacts. Essentially, uh, a hacker can add you to their contacts, and if you accept a phone call from them, it'll share your IP address to the person. This is via a voice call. It's been known for years, but just something that less technical users may not be aware of. And the reason that this happens is because by default, Telegram uses a peer-to-peer -peer connection between callers for better quality and reduced latency. So you can go into your Telegram settings and switch off a setting where it will use this by default, and so you can actually somewhat protect yourself from this. Okay, and our last company story, this comes from a forum post, you know, so I kind of made up a headline, AirVPN disclosure servers, discloses server seized in 2015. Somebody just randomly posted an AirVPN's forum. They're like, hey, has AirVPN ever had any like legal issues like subpoenas, requests for user data, anything? I'm just gonna go ahead and read their whole response. It's about a paragraph long. We can disclose only now that we had a server in Toronto seized in 2015, initially without our knowledge. Maybe a core order was served to the data center. For about 10 days, we did not understand what happened to the server, which did not respond while the data center did not provide information. After 10 days, Italian police and not any magistrate contacted us. They informed us that Toronto police and FBI, which they note that's speculation on their part. They think it was the FBI because it was an American user they were trying to get data about, asked for our help because they could not find any log in the server. Unfortunately, their help requ request came after the server had already been seized. It was obvious that forensic analysis could not find any logs simply because there were none. Our VPN servers did not even store the client certificates. Go figure. They also now run in RAM disks, but in 2015, they did not. The whole matter was led by informing us without any document from any court or magistrate, but only through official and informal police communications and only to ask for help after forensic analysis obviously failed completely. We were not asked to keep confidentiality on the matter, but just to stay on the safe side and support the investigation on what appeared a serious crime. And then in parentheses, a whole database of information of a commercial service was cracked, stolen and published in public when the website owners did not pay ransom while our server was apparently not used for the crack it was to use to upload elsewhere the database. We decided not to disclose the whole matter for at least seven years. It's one of those cases confirming our servers do not store log data or meta metadata of clients' traffic. And then in the forum post, there's a, a one, one more post from another user who's just like, I have so many questions about this. Like, why are you just now telling us? Like, just, just a, a bunch of questions like that. Yeah, I don't know. Take that for what you will. Well, let's go ahead and dive into the research. So attackers can force iOS and macOS browsers to divulge passwords and much more. So this is an attack that forces uh, Apple Safari browser to divulge passwords, Gmail message content, and other secrets by exploiting a side channel vulnerability in the A and M series CPUs running modern iOS and macOS. This is called eye leakage and it requires minimal resources to carry out. It does, however, require extensive reverse engineering of Apple hardware and significant expertise in exploiting a class of vulnerability known as a side channel. So side channels are typically on the more sophisticated side of things. They implement iLeakage as a website, so when it's visited by a vulnerable device, the website uses JavaScript to open a separate website of the attacker's choice and recover site content rendered in the pop-up window. So they leverage this to recover YouTube viewing history, the content of a Gmail inbox, when a target is locked in, and a password as it's being autofilled by a credential manager. Once visited, the iLeakage site requires about five minutes to profile the target machine and another 30 seconds to extract a 512-bit secret, such as a 64-character string. This does only work against Macs, only when running Safari, iPhones and iPads can be attacked when running any browsers because they're all based on WebKit. An Apple rep said iLeakage advances the company's understanding and that the company is aware of the vulnerability and plans to address it in an upcoming release. There is no designation CVE to track this vulnerability. All right, this next story comes from Canada and it gets worse as it goes. We caught technicians at Best Buy, Mobile Clinic, Canada Computers, and others snooping on our personal devices. CBC's Marketplace took smartphones and laptops to repair stores across Ontario, including large chains Best Buy and 
and Mobile Clinic and found that more than half of the documented cases, technicians access intimate photos and private information not relevant to the repair. Marketplace dropped off devices at 20 stores, ranging from small independent shops to medium-sized chains to larger national chains after installing monitoring software on the devices. In total, 16 stores were recorded. At four stores, the tracking software didn't log anything or the stores didn't appear to turn the devices on. The summary here... <laughs> Technicians at nine stores access private data, including one technician who not only viewed the photos, but copied them onto a USB stick. At least one store also covered up evidence of the viewing of the photos where they uh, deleted it from, because it was a Windows computer, they deleted it from like the recently accessed menu so that the owner wouldn't have any idea. I'm just gonna leave it at that. Feel free to read the story because they go into detail at like every single store and what they found and what they observed. Samsung Galaxy S23 was hacked twice on the first day of Pwn to Own Toronto. Pentest Limited was the first to demo a zero day on Samsung's flagship Galaxy S23 device by exploiting improper input validation weakness to gain code execution. Fun note here that Nate put in is that this is the exact same class of exploit that was used in the 2022 competition on the Galaxy S22. They also demoed exploits and vulnerability chains targeting zero days in Xiaomi's 13 Pro, as well as printers, smart speakers, NAS devices, and surveillance cameras from Western Digital, QNAP, Synology, Canon, Lexmark, and Sonos. Security researchers hacked the S23 smartphone two more times on the second day. The Interrupt Lab security researchers were the first to demo the zero day in an improper input validation attack, while a Tochim team exploited a permissive list of allowed inputs to hack Samsung's flagship. Okay, so this next one is a proof of concept. I think, it, if I remember correctly, it comes from that website, Fingerprint. They wrote this blog post about how in Chrome, you can use the site engagement feature to track visitors. They say in Chrome, every profile lists websites the user frequently visits and interacts with. This is called site engagement service and it provides information about how engaged a user is with a site. The primary signal is the amount of active time the user spends on the site, but there are various other signals. And the documentation further lists that the score is increased by values such as scrolling, clicking, key presses, media playback, and adding a website to the home screen. Chrome 75 introduced an on by default safety feature to protect users from social engineering attacks by malicious websites that impersonate other websites. We can therefore conclude that Chrome is searching for a well-known pattern to determine whether a website the user navigated to resembles a popular domain or a website with high engagement scores. An important detail is that lookalike warnings behave differently for different users to minimize false positives. Sites that show a warning to you may not show for other users unless that user has visited the same site you have. This means that a specifically crafted website name can be used to determine whether a user is engaged with a chosen site. Since disabling these things are impossible, we believe it's important to discuss these features' privacy implications. For some people, the risks of exposing their browser history to a targeted attack might be far worse than being tricked by lookalike phishing websites. I may have copied the wrong parts. I'm trying to condense because this whole article is good. You guys should go read it. But I was trying to condense this as much as possible. And basically, Chrome has these hidden features that monitor how often you visit a website, how much you engage with that website. And basically, those websites can access this data in a, in a very side channel kind of way. And in theory, they could use that data to track you or to try to, I guess, just do all kinds of malicious things, you know, phishing websites and things like that. Based on how often you visit a website, how familiar you are with it, you may not get these warnings. Like I said, the article has a lot more detail if you want more. Next story is super quick. So out of more than 1.8 million administrator credentials analyzed, over 40,000, which is, you know, a small percentage of that, but still 40,000 entries were just admin showing that the default password is widely accepted by IT administrators. The next one, probably not a surprise to our more veteran listeners, AI chatbots can infer an alarming amount of info about you from your responses. Researchers found that large language models that power advanced chatbots can accurately infer an alarming amount of personal information about users, including race, location, occupation, and more from conversations that appear innocuous. They say that scammers could use chatbots' ability to guess sensitive information to harvest sensitive data from unsuspecting users. They also add that the same underlying capability could portend a new era of advertising in which companies use information gathered from chatbots to build detailed profiles of users. Well, the next story is just a few more like stats, one of those research articles, and it's how Americans view data privacy. So this is a survey and they shared that it's actually gone up, the amount of people who are worried about government use of their data to 71% today. 67% say they understand little to nothing about what companies are doing with their personal data, which is up, and most believe they have little to no control over what companies or the government do with their data. While these shares have ticked down compared with 2019, vast majorities feel this way about data collected by companies and the government. Some 72% of Americans say there should be more regulation than there is now, just 7% say there should be less, 
and support for more regulation reaches across the political aisle, with 78% of Democrats and 68% of Republicans taking this stance. Okay, in our last research story, September was a record month for ransomware attacks in 2023. This is another one of those that's just dense with statistics, just like that last article, so go check the article for full data, but some interesting ones. According to NCC Group Data, ransomware groups launched 514 attacks in September. This surpasses March 2023, the previous record, which was 459 attacks and was heavily skewed by the go anywhere. That's the move it data breach, right? That was something else. In terms of targeted regions, North America was 50%. That was the most, followed by Europe with 30%. Asia was third with 9%. The most targeted sectors were industrial, like construction, engineering, and commercial services, consumer cyclicals, like retail, media, and hotels, and technology, like software, IT, networking, and telecommunications, and then healthcare was last. NCC's report highlights that from January to September of this year, it has recorded nearly 3,500 attacks, and it is now likely the final figure will be close to 4,000 by the end of the year. Now we're going to jump into politics, and this first one is kind of an interesting story. So cops can now fly drones from anywhere in the world using just a web browser. Paladin is selling a small piece of hardware that acts as the brain for any off-the-shelf drone. So it's like an extension to any drone that allows you to control it remotely from a web browser. And this has a ton of built-in things like gunshot detection and license plate readers that is really aimed at police usage. And so, of course, you're going to see a lot of police departments like in California, Georgia, New Jersey who are testing this out and they're actually trying to implement this as the first line, the first set of eyes as a crime scene or emergency, since they can get there faster than a patrol officer. But of course, we're seeing people fight back on this because civil liberties groups are saying people don't want buzzing drones around their heads all day and night collecting data about them and without very much regulation as we've seen in other surveillance tools that are being used by police officers. This is just an unfolding story. I mean, it's pretty typical for this podcast, we're going to see people defend this for civil liberties, and you're going to see them try to employ this. And they are planning to launch more autonomous features, including the ability for cops to give drones advanced instructions for given emergencies. Like if there's a missing person, the drone will scan a specific area for people and alert operators if it finds one. The drone can then follow that person until an officer arrives on scene to determine if it's the person they're looking for. Colorado Court OK's use of Google search data in murder case. The Colorado Supreme Court ruled on Monday that evidence gleaned from a warrant for Google search data could be used in a murder case, sparking concerns the decision may encourage more police to embrace the controversial technique. After a 2020 fire that killed five people in the Denver area, police were scrambling to identify suspects. They asked Google to provide information about people who searched for the address of the house that went up in flames using a novel approach known as a keyword search warrant. After some initial objections, Google shared the data that enabled detectives to zero in on five accounts, leading to an arrest of three teens. In its 74-page decision, the court found that the law enforcement had acted in good faith when it obtained the warrant for the teen's search history. Still, it stressed that the findings were specific to the facts of the case, and it refrained from weighing in about the use of Google search data more broadly. Another familiar name, face search company Clearview AI, overturned UK's privacy fine. There was a fine last year for $7.5 million by the ICO over in the UK, and Clearview actually succeeded in appealing against that fine and enforcement action because it was used solely by law enforcement bodies outside the UK. The three-member tribunal at the first tier tribunal, which heard the appeal, concluded that though Clearview did not carry out data processing related to monitoring the behavior of people in the UK, the ICO did not have jurisdiction to take enforcement action or issue a fine. UK government keeps files on teaching assistants and librarians' internet activity. The government has been monitoring the social media accounts of dozens of ordinary teaching staff, including teaching assistants, and is keeping files on posts that criticize education policies. Many outraged educators have rushed to submit subject access requests compelling the DFE to release any information it holds under their name after discovering there were files up to 60 pages long about their tweets and comments challenging government policy or the school's inspectorate. One such teaching assistant and primary school librarian who mainly posts uncontroversial children's book reviews discovered from such a request that DFE had a file alerting colleagues to tweets from her complaining about a lack of funding for school libraries. Another primary school teacher who leads on English said, quote, is this a good use of the DFE's limited time and resources? No, there are huge challenges facing schools that desperately need addressing, unquote. The Observer's story a fortnight ago revealed how the DFE tried to cancel a conference because two of its speakers, early years experts Ruth Swalis, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, and Aaron Bradbury, had previously been critical of government policy. Now it has emerged that the department made similar threats in order to stop another expert who has been critical from speaking at a different education conference. I'm probably going to screw this name up too. Uh, Dr. Dr. Mini Conkbayer 
an award-winning early childhood author and consultant, was told by the organizers of an early years conference for nursery staff and childminders in Bristol back in March, for which she was due to give the speech, that the DFE had threatened to withdraw funding for the conference if she spoke. They were unhappy about her criticisms of their policies on social media. Privacy Advocate challenges YouTube ad blocking detection scripts under EU law. So, okay, context. For those of you who haven't experienced this, if you're using an ad blocker, whether it's uBlock Origin or Braze ad blocker or whatever, you've probably stumbled on YouTube going, you're using an ad blocker and we don't like that. But that's kind of it. You can still bypass it in most situations, at least I've been able to, and still watch YouTube. But someone is saying via the Irish Data Protection Commission that YouTube's deployment of JavaScript code to detect the use of ad blocking extensions by website visitors is not okay and it's a privacy violation. So they're going into the nitty gritty and they say on October 16th, Google published a support page declaring that when you block YouTube ads, you violate YouTube's terms of service, but YouTube's terms of service does not explicitly disallow ad blocking. But the language says users may not circumvent, disable, fraudulently engage with, or otherwise interfere with any part of the service, which probably includes ads. YouTube's open hostility to ad blockers coincides with the recent trial deployment of a pop-up notice presented to web users who visit the site with an ad blocking extension in their browser, messaging tested on a limited audience at least as far back as May. In order to present the pop-up, YouTube needs to run a script changed at least twice a day to detect blocking efforts. And that script, Hanf believes, who's the person who's challenging this, violates the EU's e-privacy directive because YouTube did not first ask for explicit consent to conduct such browser interrogation. Next, we'll hop over to the Netherlands, where a consumer group is suing Amazon over privacy violations. Stichting Data Bes Beskerming Nederland, SDBN. Sorry to all the Dutch listeners. <laughs> They're a consumer rights group. They have filed a class action lawsuit against Amazon, accusing the tech giant of violating the EU's privacy law. This lawsuit alleges that Amazon tracks website visitors' online activity without their permission through the use of cookies. Uh, it also elects that they collect personal data, tracking customers' behavior across various websites and its own platforms, and then uses this information to sell targeted advertising space. According to the Wall Street Journal, SDBN is demanding that Amazon cease collecting data in this manner and stop using it to follow consumers online. The lawsuit represents approximately 5 million Amazon account holders residing in the Netherlands. By taking legal action, SDBN hopes to exert pressure on Amazon, compelling the company to recognize the consequences of its practices and make the necessary changes per the report. Now we're gonna go into FOSS, free and open source. And the first one is from Brave, who appears to install VPN services without user consent. So if you have the Brave browser installed on Windows, then you may also have Brave VPN services installed on the machine as well. The article notes that Firefox also offers a VPN service. And it's worth noting that the article speculates that Brave did so without consent, but it's possible it's buried in the terms of service. Next up, secure password sharing is now available in ProtonPass. So the title really says it all. If you read the article, they keep saying you can now share passwords with anyone, but what they really mean is any ProtonPass user. Because when I first heard that, I was like, so is this kind of like ProtonMail where you can uh, you know, add a password and send it to somebody? which admittedly would be kind of weird to add a password to a password entry, but I digress. You can share it with any ProtonPass user, regardless of whether they're a free user, paid user, whatever. If you have a free plan, you'll be able to share vaults with up to two others, which is more than any other free password manager. Paid subscribers can create up to 20 vaults with nine others per vault. Next article is from Tor, and it's about censorship circumvention and uh, security audit findings. So they asked, Cure 53 to perform a security audit of Tor browser and other tools related to censorship circumvention. And a series of penetration tests and code audits were performed specifically targeting methods by which users connect to bridges in Tor browser, as well as Uni Probe, RDSys, BridgeDB, and Conjure. We invite you to read the full report. The testing period covered 72 days between November and April and was followed by a period of issue mitigation. The auditors remarked that although the scope was large, the number of issues uncovered was low and that Tor in general adopts an admirably robust and hardened security posture and sound design decisions. The auditor further said our code was written to a first-rate standard and confirmed to secure coding practices and that we have adopted highly advanced and deliberately security-focused building processes around Tor browser because of reproducible builds, build signing, and more. All which contribute towards considerable defense in-depth security posture. They concluded that the components they audited are in a healthy state from a security standpoint. The audit outlined vulnerabilities, weaknesses, and a couple of high severity issues alongside a set of recommended fixes and hardening guidance. 
pretty much Tor did well. Uh, two high severity issues were discovered that they have subsequently been mitigated by the Tor project following the recommendations. And looking ahead, they intend to continue to conduct regular security assessments and share them with you. And then on that note, real quick one, it says, if you value Tor, please make a donation. I guess I just kind of wanted to signal boost this, you know, especially in light of that article we just covered. Right now, the Tor network, the Tor browser, Onion services, Snowflake, and the ecosystem of tools and services built and maintained by the Tor project are protecting the privacy of millions of people. Because the Tor project is a nonprofit, this work is powered by donations from our community. Last year, charitable giving from individuals from the U.S. decreased by 10.5% compared to the year prior. This has only happened four times in U.S. history since 1956. We can confirm that this trend is real, and we've seen it continue throughout 2023 and across our network of global supporters. Widespread tech sector layoffs also mean that hundreds of thousands of people have unexpectedly lost their jobs, and this has disproportionately impacted our community. We know this is a difficult time for many people who use and love Tor. Even in difficult economic conditions, Tor is and always will be free. Unrestricted access to the technology we care about is part of our mission, but the challenges of 2023 and beyond mean if you are in a position to donate this year, your support is more vital than ever. So if you value the privacy that Tor offers yourself and others, please make a donation today. Your contribution will help to continue to ensure Tor continues to provide online privacy to everyone who needs it and help us reach ambitious goals during difficult economic times. Next one is really quick. Threema is enabling end-to-end -end encrypted group calls for everybody. So this is for Android, which now has end-to-end -end encrypted calls with up to 16 participants. But now for iOS, this also has the same feature. So now you have this on Android and iOS, unleashing the full potential of group calls for all users. So, All right, in our last story, Matrix says they now have 115 million users. So the team behind Matri the Matrix Open Standard and Real-Time Communication Protocol has announced the release of its second major version, bringing end-to-end -end encryption to group voice over IP, faster loading times, and more. This growth is nearly doubled from its 60 million users in July of last year, which itself marked a 79% increase from summer of 2021. So they are growing by leaps and bounds. And misfits. We're gonna start with Mozilla, who's launched their annual digital privacy creepo meter. And this year's status is <gasps> very creepy. So products are getting more secure, but also a lot less private. More companies are meeting Mozilla's minimum security standards, like using encryption and providing automatic software updates, and that's good. But at the same time, companies are collecting and sharing users' personal data like never before. And that's the bad news. An increasing number of products can't be used offline. And in the past, the privacy conscious could always buy a connected device but turn off connectivity. And that's no longer an option in many cases. Uh, so this is kind of the trend. Privacy policies are also getting ridiculous. Ambiguity and policies that sprawl across multiple documents and URLs are the status quo, and it's only getting worse, not better. This next one, I think, is mostly kind of made the rounds, but just in case you guys missed the memo, Signal says there is no evidence rumored zero-day bug is real. So there was a... Um I think this was last week. There were like screenshots going around that somebody was saying they heard it from a friend or something like that, that the generate link previews feature was being abused as a zero day vulnerability, which for the record is not outside the realm of possibility because we saw something exactly like that with WhatsApp a few years back. However, Signal, according to this article, Signal has investigated rumors and states that there is no evidence this vulnerability is real. The last article is one that uh, we covered on the TechLore side of things, and it hope, I hope it made the rounds because it was pretty concerning, but Google hosted a malvertising campaign which led to fake KeePass site that looked genuine. So if you look in the Google results, the top result could be sponsored result, and then underneath you see the actual KeePass website but the sponsored result looks exactly like a normal KeePass website. Um, even the URL looks almost exactly the same thanks to a Unicode trick that they used. And once you go there, you download KeePass and it installs a malicious version of KeePass because it's actually a fake website. All right, and that was all we got this week. So iPhones were exposing Mac addresses. If you're an iPhone user, be sure to update. Google is rolling out some updates that are probably good for the end user, but you know, just be aware of their shortcomings. Samsung is shutting down phones remotely. AirVPN had a server seized. Apple had some browser exploits, which again, I think most of those were fixed. So, um, or are gonna be fixed soon. So again, updates, lots and lots of topics, huge stuff going on this week. So, so thank you guys for listening. Again, we wanna remind you, if you have not been laid off by a tech company, <laughs> we would really appreciate any support you can give us if you want. We have a Patreon, we have a LibrePay, and we have Monero. If you are not in a position to support us financially, we totally understand. Spread the podcast around, you know, share it with somebody, especially if you found a particular story interesting, go ahead and find the timestamp. We don't have ads in our podcast, so you can find that that exact timestamp and send that to them. It really does mean a lot to us. And I think it's personally a huge endorsement to share something with somebody and be like, hey, I really recommend this. So I would consider that 
an honor. Thank you for listening this week. And you know, last thing, if you're on a platform where you can subscribe, leave a rating, leave a comment, anything you can do to uh, help boost our reach. We're trying to reach as many people as possible with the message of privacy and every little thing that you guys can do helps us do that. So thank you very much. And hopefully we will both be back on time next week with not such a long week.